So the title of our first session today um, is Food Security. Thank you. Fe food Security, Feeding Our Rapidly Expanding Population Sustainably Into and Through an Age of Climate Change. So as Jack mentioned, my name is Allison Miller. I am a professor of biology here at St. Louis University. I'm a plant evolutionary biologist, and I'm interested in perennial crops and their wild relatives. In addition to working at SLU, I work very closely with botanists at the Missouri Botanical Garden and also at the Danforth Plant Science Center, where my lab is currently based. Um, today, um, I'm really pleased to welcome two world-class researchers, one in person and one virtually, as we'll hear in a moment. Um, so one of the researchers is an economist based at Cornell University working to diversify food systems in India, and the second is a plant physiologist based at the University of Illinois studying how crops adapt and can be adapted to changing climates, including elevated ozone levels. So feeding a growing population in a changing climate in a sustainable way that achieves food security and simultaneously supports ecosystem security and the preservation of biodiversity in the long term is a primary challenge of our day. The complexity of this challenge requires a diversity of perspectives and approaches. So our panelists today are going to highlight two ways in which researchers are working to adapt our agricultural systems, but there are many others, and I hope that some of those will come up um, during the discussion following the presentations. So first, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Prabhu Pingali. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Pingali had to return to Cornell due to a family emergency yesterday. Somehow, he was able to record his presentation before he left, which we're, we're going to watch in a moment. But I wanted to share with you um, some of his incredible accomplishments. So currently, Dr. Pingali is the director of the Teta Cornell Institute for Agriculture and Nutrition, which is in the Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management uh, at the College of Business at Cornell. He earned a master, Master's of Arts degree in economics from Birla Institute of Technology and Science in India and a PhD in economics from North Carolina State University. He's written more than 10 books and more than 100, 100 technical articles. Sorry, extra zero. So interestingly, prior to joining the faculty at Cornell, Dr. Pingali served in, as an agricultural economist at, at almost all of the major crop research institutes that I know of in the world. So these include the International Crops Research Institute for Semi-Arid Trop Tropics, that's ICRASAT in Hy Hyderabad, India, the World Bank, the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines, the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center Simit in Mexico, the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome, and immediately prior to moving to Cornell, he served as the Deputy Director for Agricultural Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Seattle. Um, so Dr. Pingali is the founding director of this Institute for Agriculture and Nutrition. Um, their primary contribution is thinking about food not only in terms of calories consumed, but in terms of the, the diversity of uh, plants that are eaten and the diversity of nutrients that are uh, consumed. So Dr. Pingali holds many awards. Um, I'll just mention a few. He's a distinguished fellow in the American uh, Agricultural Economics Association and a foreign associate of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and an honorary life member of the International Association of Agricultural uh, Economists. So unfortunately he can't be here in person, but we're going to now take a moment and watch the video that he um, recorded yesterday. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here at the St. Louis Climate Summit. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Peter Raven for inviting me to this event. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about climate change and food security. There's a lot of concern about how climate change is going to impact agriculture, agriculture productivity, food supplies, and food security. There's a lot of feeling that we as a global community will not be able to feed ourselves, especially people living in the developing world, especially the very poor in the developing world. Let me say that based on past experience, 
I am cautiously optimistic that we will overcome the impacts of climate change. I'm ca cautiously optimistic that technological innovations and human ingenuity will help us enhance productivity of current agriculture lands and allow us to keep agriculture productivity high despite the threats imposed by climate change. Why do I feel optimistic? I'd like to go back to the 1960s, or even earlier, the 1950s, when much of the developed world was extremely concerned about the high levels of population growth in the developing world. There was concerns that the developing world, with its unabated population growth rates, would not be able to feed itself, and that we would be facing a Malthusian doomsday where the rate of growth in population would far exceed rate of growth in food supplies. And therefore, we would see famines taking place and massive food deficits. And that was a concern that was quite widespread in the 50s, in the 60s. At the same time, you had people like Esther Bostrup, a very renowned anthropologist, who argued that even with rising populations and rising population densities, we as a community would able to feed ourselves because we would respond to these uh, dramatically shrinking land resource and agriculture resource bases through new technologies, through new innovations, through new ways of bringing human ingenuity to the task of addressing the problem of food production, food productivity, and food supply. So those were the two competing paradigms that were being discussed in the 50s and in the 60s. And the, the paradigm of the more positive outlook of um, technological change, won out through the Green Revolution. Norman Borlaug, the Nobel laureate, was able to show that through research and through technology innovation, one could enhance the overall productivity of wheat crops. So he was able to show that you could generate new varieties of wheat that were four or five times as productive as the current varieties. These miracle wheat varieties that were bred in Mexico were part of the, the start of the Green Revolution that took place. At the same time, in a small institution in the Philippines called the International Rice Research Institute, a similar miracle rice variety was developed, which could give you a rice crop of four to five times what you would get with a traditional crop of rice. These two varieties, the modern rice variety, the modern wheat variety, spread across Asia. Uh, and they spread across Asia towards the later part of the 1960s, around 66, 67, that time period. By about 1974, 1975, much of Asia became self-sufficient in food. The dire predictions that Asia would be starving were, were changed. They, you saw this big dramatic improvements that took place in overall food productivity, overall food supplies, etc. And that was a change that happened primarily because of new investments in technology, research investments, infrastructure investments, and policy investments that allowed for farmers to adopt better technologies and thereby increase overall productivity. And that led to dramatic changes in food security across Asia and across the developing world. So as we look ahead, as we look at the future, the next 20 years, the next 30 years, the next 50 years, is the food security challenge different
from the challenge that was there in the past. Well, we know that we still have around 800 million or so people in the world that are hungry. Much of this population is geographically concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa and in parts of South Asia. Much of the problem of hunger today is not a problem of a lack of availability of food, but rather it's a problem of access to food and access to food for the poorest of the poor. And much of the problem of food security today is also a problem that's related to conflicts and extreme climate events that are taking place. And, and one would anticipate that this will continue to be the situation for the foreseeable future. In addition to that, we have the implications of climate change, rising temperatures, and how that affects food security. Now, as we think about the needs of the future populations for food, it's really important for us to understand that we're not just talking about the total quantities of staple grains, such as rice and wheat, that are needed. We are we're seeing that as incomes rise, as urbanization takes place, that there's not just an increase in the quantity of food that's consumed by, on a per capita basis, but there's a big change in the types of food that are consumed, the number of food groups that are consumed. So there's quite a significant increase in the diversity of food that's consumed. And the diversity coming not, in, not just in uh, adding grains, but also bringing in vegetables, fruit, other horticultural products, dairy products, livestock products, etc. So those are the big changes that are coming. But in terms of some of the implications for climate change, it's important to know that as the livestock consumption increases, as some of the horticulture product consumption increases, then the resource intensity of these crops can have significant impacts on climate change. And that's something one needs to think about as we look ahead. We know that as we look towards 2050 time period, we see that we need to see significant overall increases in productivity if we need to meet the needs of the population that we expect to see at that time period. And a population that's much richer and demands a greater diversity of diets. We know that we need around 50% more staple grains than we have today. And we probably need 80 to 100% more in terms of higher value crops, horticulture products, vegetable products, animal products, etc. And that's an enormous challenge. It's an enormous challenge even without having to address climate change impacts on agriculture productivity. But bringing in climate change impacts makes it an even bigger challenge from a food security point of view. So what are some of the big climate change impacts that we would expect for food security? So if you think about food security in terms of three dimensions, it's food availability, access to food, and stability of food supplies. In terms of availability, one can imagine that the productivity of agriculture systems would be affected through climate change, especially with rising temperatures. And that would have a negative effect on overall supplies of staple grains, but also of non-staples, including livestock products. And as the the supply shifts downwards through increased uh, effects of climate change. One would anticipate prices to rise, and that would have an effect on food access. And as you see, increased incidence of uh, uh, extreme events, extreme events such as um, floods, droughts, etc., that would cre create 
major disruptions in food supplies and create food shocks and that has um, that will have a very adverse effect on stability of food supplies across the world but primarily uh, having big impacts in the developing world. So when we think about what's happening with the uh, rising temperatures then the story on climate change impacts on agriculture productivity is very much a north-south story. You find that the countries of the south, that's where much of the developing world is, countries in Asia, uh, Africa, Latin America, much, much of this re these regions of the world will suffer significantly and in terms of their ability to adapt to rising temperatures. In these parts of the world, you would see negative impacts on productivity. Whereas countries in the north, uh, parts of the US, Europe, etc., would see some positive benefits coming from climate change and see much larger areas going into agriculture production and with higher productivity impacts in agriculture. So you see this bifurcation that takes place um, based on whether one is based in the north or in the south, and the south will be the area where the effects are going to be the strongest. The other big impact, of course, that you will see, and we, we are already beginning to see parts of that uh, happening today, is the rising incidence of extreme events. Um, we see droughts um, becoming a global phenomenon these days, and the incidence of droughts becoming extremely common uh, across the world, and flooding. We've seen flooding happening both in the north and in the south. Uh, we've seen flooding, extreme flooding conditions in the US last year, in the Caribbean, but also extreme flooding in India, China, etc. And, and these extreme events will have significant effects on agriculture supplies, food supplies, and, and create shocks in the food market. So, what are some of the production impacts that one can Im imagine coming from climate change? So some of the production impacts would be primarily, first in terms of increased cost of production. As productivity uh, is negatively affected by climate change, farmers would respond through increased input use especially increased chemical input use, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, etc., in order to control some of the newer diseases, some of the newer pest pressures, etc., that come about because of climate change. You also begin to see for very low-income farmers, for small farmers, their income are affected through the productivity loss that takes place and the higher input needed to sustain productivity. And that income loss will definitely affect their ability to graduate from low income status to higher income status to middle class populations, etc. Price fluctuations, price fluctuations, especially uh, as farmers cope with drought conditions, flooding conditions, etc., are going to be a very common phenomenon. And they can affect not just the staples, but the higher value crops, the horticulture crops, the livestock products, etc. And food safety concerns will become even bigger. Food safety concerns primarily coming about because of the changes that take place in the pest and disease complex, uh, especially in tropical agriculture systems, but also in terms of the amounts of chemicals that are applied to control these problems, and that resulting in runoff into groundwater systems and creating pollution of drinking water, etc. So those are some of the, the adverse effects of climate change on agriculture. But agriculture itself has significant Im impacts on climate change. Agriculture's impacts on climate change come from uh, 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, primarily methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions coming from agricultural systems. You, we see from the graphs here that agriculture is a predominant contributor to methane emissions and it ranks much higher than even the energy sector in terms of methane emissions. Uh, and nitrous oxide emissions also, agriculture tends to have the largest share of nitrous oxide emissions coming from uh, large amounts of fertilizer use and fuel use in agricultural systems. Now, when you think about greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture, you find that the, the big contribution to greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock systems. Livestock production, uh, organic manure use, etc., cetera, are, are a very large contributor. But, and so is synthetic fertilizer use. So these are some of the big factors that are affecting greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture systems. And in terms of crops, the single biggest contributor from a crop point of view is the rice crop. Flooded rice paddies, which are the mainstay of the food system in Asia, tend to be a major contributor to greenhouse gas emission. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge for us to say, how does agriculture um, adapt to climate impacts, but also how does agriculture mitigate some of the climate change impacts? And so as we look ahead, we need to say, what can we do in order to address the problem of climate change and adapt agriculture systems to climate change? And I think one can look ahead with a certain level of optimism. I believe that there's huge potential for technology and for innovations to have a big impact on adapting to climate change in enhancing overall productivity of agricultural systems, improving the resilience of agriculture to climate change. But I also believe that in addition to technology, we need global collaboration and global cooperation. And that cooperation would be both in, in research and in development, but also in terms of trade, in terms of aid, etc. And these are some of the things that I'd like to talk about. First on technology, I think there's a large scope for increasing overall resilience of agriculture systems through better technologies. Right now, much of the focus of agriculture research and agriculture R&D has been, has been on increasing yields and increasing productivity. But looking ahead, one needs to look at ways in which agricultural R&D is focused on drought tolerance, flood tolerance, heat resistance, etc., and making crops much more climate friendly and much more climate resilient. And I think that's where the big focus of R&D needs to be if we have to have productivity rates meeting uh, the impacts of climate change, the negative impacts of climate change. But also, we, the large parts of the developing world today where currently yields are very low, the yield gap between what's possible and what's currently produced on farmers' fields is very, very high. If we can reduce that gap, then we are able to intensify existing agriculture lands and not expand into new agriculture lands as population increases. And if we can do that, then one can see uh, uh, ways in which one can release some lands into you know, forest and bush cover, et cetera, and look at ways in which agroforestry systems, forest systems, et cetera, can create new opportunities for carbon sequestration. And that's an opportunity that will come only if we can look at, op look at ways in which we can reduce the yield gaps in cropping systems. And 
Another technological opportunity, I think, is to look at ways in which we can make the food system much more nutritious than it is today. For example, uh, there are opportunities for enhancing the micronutrient content of grains, of tuber crops, of sweet potatoes, etc. Some of the work that my students are doing is looking at ways in which the sweet potato crop itself can be enhanced with vitamin A. And a vitamin A enhanced sweet potato, which is an orange flesh sweet potato, can have enormous health benefits in the developing world. And there are opportunities such as this across several crops today. And so looking at a food system that's climate resilient and, then, and more nutritious would be a food system that would be attractive as we look ahead. Uh, technology is one part of the problem, one part of the solution. The other part of the solution is community involvement. Community involvement in creating infrastructure and systems that will allow the communities to become more resilient to climate change and to climate impacts. Some of the ways in which community-based projects can help in this climate change uh, adaptation and also in climate mitigation activities is looking at agroforestry systems where one can look at lands that are currently just grown with grain crops to having lands that have grain crops along with trees and bushes, etc., in an agroforestry system. An agroforestry system then tends to contribute to mitigating some of the effects of climate change through carbon sequestration, etc. Soil conservation practices, zero tillage systems, minimum tillage systems, incorporating rest crop residues back into the soil. These are, again, extremely valuable opportunities for mitigating the effects of climate change. Watershed management practices, where the upper watersheds are brought back to tree cover, the back to forest cover, etc., can have dual effects. They can help improve the water quality and the reliability of water supply downstream, but they also can contribute to creating an opportunity for um, new carbon carbon sinks and new ways of forestation in the system. So these are some of the opportunities that are available, but you cannot do it if they're not done at a community level. Community-based opportunities such as these are going to be extremely important as we try to, uh, to deal with climate change. Similarly, investments in irrigation. Uh, especially in South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, can play a big role in addressing the productivity of dryland areas, uh, addressing the opportunities for reducing that yield gap that I talked about earlier. And one can do this um, without resorting to uh, fossil fuel energy through either diesel pumps or using electricity, etc. One can do this through, as, through solar power, which is becoming increasingly common as a way in which um, uh, to power um, uh, irrigation pumps and to pump water, etc. And you find that in some areas, uh, these systems are being run at a community level, as I show in this picture here from uh, Gujarat and India where within a village there are several locations where these massive solar panels are being put in place for generating water, for generating power. Uh, so you find that in these villages they've successfully managed to be off the grid. And a global cooperation is going to be a major part of um, the adaptation strategy that we need for climate change. I think uh, as we look ahead and remember, we talked about the, the divide between the north and south in terms of climate impacts on agriculture, productivity. 
then one would anticipate that over time the favorable productivity patterns in the northern countries would make them more amenable to providing aid uh, during periods of deficit, during periods of food shocks, etc., to the countries in the south, especially the poorest of the poor countries, uh, the least developed countries in sub-Saharan Africa, parts of South Asia. Where, where countries can afford it, trade can play a big role. International trade can become an equalizing factor uh, in food supplies uh, between the surplus and deficit regions. Of course, the problem with trade is going to be whether countries can afford to purchase and whether uh, market mechanisms for acquiring supplies are going to work or whether countries are going to need trade in order to reduce those deficits. Safety net programs, both at a national level and an international level, safety net programs are crucial in order to, uh, to cope with climate change. Uh, one of the, the big areas where one can imagine uh, strong safety net programs is uh, with insurance, whether based insurance systems, insurances for um, extreme events, floods, drought, etc., are going to be very crucial. But we still don't have good models for making these systems work and making them work in the developing world and, and making them accessible to the poorest populations. And that's something that's, that we need urgent uh, policy uh, interventions and, and we need models that can be used across the developing world. So, as we look ahead, I'd like to say that I'm cautiously optimistic about the future. I'm optimistic that we as a global community will be able to meet the climate challenge and that we will be able to ensure food security for all, especially for the uh, people in the developing world, especially for the poorest in the developing world. And as we look ahead, we need to, to think about what we need to do differently um, in agriculture research and development and in, in agriculture policy than we were doing in the past. In the past, we were much more concerned about yields and about increasing productivity in agriculture systems. Looking ahead, we should be thinking a lot more about reducing variability in agriculture, reducing variability in yields, um, increasing the resilience of agriculture systems to shocks, and making agriculture systems more climate friendly through promoting crops that are tolerant to drought, tolerant to flooding, crops that are much more nutritious, uh, etc. So these are some of the ways in which one can look at agriculture systems responding to climate impacts. But agriculture can also help mitigate some of the climate impacts. And that can come through a much more holistic look at agriculture systems, where agriculture brings in agroforestry systems, tree-based systems, bush crops, etc., along with grain crops and other annual crops. And doing that, creating a much broader carbon sink within the agriculture system. And I think that, that would be crucial as we look ahead. Similarly, there are opportunities for soil conservation practices, for soil management practices that can also contribute to mitigating some of the effects of climate change. As we look ahead, I think it's also important to, to realize that not that every country doesn't have to deal with this problem completely on their own, that there's a lot of global learning that can happen. There's a lot of multilateral cooperation that can happen in identifying technologies, but also in disseminating and promoting technologies around the world. And this multilateral cooperation would be absolutely crucial for the poorer countries, 
for the countries that just don't have the capacity for R&D today. And that multilateral cooperation would enhance the overall global efforts in adapting to cl climate change. So I think it's, it's crucial to understand that looking ahead, we're talking not just about technology. We're not talking just about human ingenuity, but we're also talking about global cooperation. Bringing these three together will help us overcome some of the uncertainties around climate change in the future. So, thank you very much.